Well, today we're going to wrap up chapter 5 of 1 Peter. And next week, we're going to roll right into 2 Peter. We have a, a new sermon series on the weekend at the movies. But because of copyright, we can't re-show those videos. So we wanted to keep in the biblical text where we are, 1 Peter, and move right into 2 Peter. And he opens uh, this chapter, chapter 5 of Peter, with, a, with the idea of the leaders of the church called elders. They're also called overseers or shepherds. As near as I can tell, those three words are basically the same. Elders, overseers, shepherds. Elders talks about the age and wisdom they have. Overseers talks about the role of supervision. Shepherds talks about a metaphor that is throughout the Bible. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Read the first four verses and then answer this question. How many shepherds can you think of in the Bible?
How many of you guys come up with? Is that, I'm going to tick off a few. Abraham was a shepherd, the father of the Jewish nation. Moses was a shepherd, like literally, for 40 years in the wilderness. He's the founder of the Jewish nation. David was the king, the greatest king of the Jewish nation. Religious leaders in general were called shepherds. Even a guy named Cyrus, you go, who is he? Well, he was a Persian. He wasn't Jewish. In fact, he was a pagan leader who liberated the Jews, and he's the only non-Christian or non-Jewish leader that was predicted by name in all the Bible before he was ever alive. Yahweh is called a shepherd. You remember the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And of course, Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd in John 10. One of the characteristics of any good godly leader is humility. I think that's why shepherding is such a powerful metaphor for godly leaders. Well, why don't you take some time now as a group to read verses 5 through 7 and answer this question, why is humility so important and how is it connected to submission? And, and this is the claim of Peter, in dealing with anxiety.
Okay, in verses 8 through 11, Peter's going to lay out five ideas that make suffering easier. So if you're have a, having a time of it right now, I think this could be really encouraging to you. Here's, here's the text with the major ideas of how you can make suffering easier according to Peter. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So here's the first idea. Peter says, be sober, be alert. <laughs> if you know anything about Peter, you know he knows something about not being alert. Not once, but twice. He fell asleep while Jesus was praying, one on the Mount of Transfiguration and then to his detriment in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before Jesus died. So here's the second idea. Resist him, that is the devil, standing firm in the faith. The second concept is to resist the devil. A lot of people don't think they can because they think that the devil has way more power than he actually does. Do you realize you have all the power you need to resist the devil? Oh, sure, he's shrewd. Sure, he knows you well. Sure, he's powerful and his demons. But the power in you will trump the power of the devil every time if you let it. And here's the power you have, three things specifically. The blood of Jesus Christ to forgive your sins the power of the Holy Spirit to guide you in your way, and the Word of God to give you wise counsel. If you are in the Word, trusting the Spirit, and claiming the blood of Christ, Satan cannot, cannot stand against you. In fact, Jesus' half-brother James had this to say, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. Stand firm. Here's the next idea. Verse 9, the second half. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Here's the third concept. You're not alone. There are people who are suffering just like you, many worse than you. There are people around you who love you, who understand you, who care for you. You're not alone in your suffering. Verse 10 says, And the God of all grace who called you by his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's the fourth concept. Suffering is short. And the fifth, right on its heels, your reward is eternal. So you're smart people. I believe that. I want to take some time right now in your group to share strategies that you found effective for resisting Satan.
Peter concludes this letter with a personal greeting, and, and I, I love it. I want to point out two specific relationships that really give insight in the kind of relationships that will make you more successful during a season of suffering. Verse 12 says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. You might remember the name of Silas from Acts 15. There was this big debate in Jerusalem, and the debate was whether Gentiles could come into the church without being circumcised. In other words, can you just become a Christian, or do you have to become a Jew, then a Christian? Well, the debate sided with Gentile inclusion, and the guys on the one side were Peter, Paul, James, and a man named Silas. And when they decided to go out again on a second missionary journey, Paul took Silas with him to deliver this decree of the Jerusalem council. Silas, it, it says in verse 32, was also a prophet. Now my question is, why was Silas, the companion of Paul, who went out and preached with Paul, why is he now with Peter? And it looks like he's actually the scribe that wrote down the book. You, you may not know this, but this book of 1 Peter is actually pretty good Greek. It's better Greek than Peter would have known. And that's probably because Silas was the amanuensis scribing things down. But the question stands, how did he move from Paul to Peter? And verse 13 says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greeting. And I want to pause there for just a second. She who is in Babylon, Babylon is not likely the literal country of Babylon, but a metaphor for Rome. Now, why do I say that? Listen. 
he goes on to say, and so does my son Mark send his greeting. John Mark was a companion of Peter. He was also a companion of Paul. In chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Acts, John Mark followed Paul and for some reason, he left the journey early. Paul was mad. In fact, if you fast forward to Acts 16, you realize that Paul and his friend Barnabas split company. I mean, it was, a, it was a blowout fight. And they said, we can't travel together, so let's travel in partnership. I'll go this way, you go that. And Barnabas took John Mark with him. Later, John Mark winds up being not only a companion of Peter, but also the amanuensis for his gospel. So Silas wrote the letter and John Mark wrote the gospel of Mark under Peter's uh, like telling all the stories of Jesus. So what can we learn from Silas and John Mark about partnerships with the gospel? And before you answer that question, I just wanna encourage you to think about it this way. I cannot do life alone. My partnership with Ashley in preaching and his with me is essential to my success and hopefully to his as well. I have men in my life that are counselors for me, guides to me, and I have men that some of them are around me that make me better, and some are guys that I'm bringing up discipling as they get older. Who do you have in your life, circle above, circle around, circle below, that makes you successful in sustaining the gospel during difficult days. Let's talk about that question.
The last verse of this book is a weird one, at least to us. It says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Okay, kiss of love, what are we talking about? Well, you know, many cultures will give greetings on the right cheek or left, and it's, it's, it's totally appropriate in their culture. It feels weird to us. But even though it was normal in the early church to greet with a kiss, and it, not just the early church, the Roman community and Jewish communities greeted men with men a kiss on the cheek. Christians were still accused of incest because of this kiss of peace in the community. A part of it was they had to hide their community gatherings because of persecution. The very thing that caused Peter to write this letter. The way I want to phrase it with you right now is, what would you do to love the people of this group even if it caused difficulties in the community. What, what could you do during the summer, especially if you're not gonna meet uh, in person over the summer, maybe people are on vacation. What can you do, and this is an important question, that would bind you together as a group? So here's my challenge. What can you do for the remainder of the summer to make sure your group has a kiss of love, whatever that looks like, to bind you together especially when you find yourself apart.
Thank you.